It's number one, hydrogen, the first element on the periodic table, and literally the most abundant substance in the universe. It's even inside your body. Humans are around 10% hydrogen by mass. That abundance is just one of the reasons that for decades, hydrogen has been hailed as a possible next leap forward in green energy. But the hydrogen economy has never quite materialized. And in most applications, the cost of hydrogen power is still stubbornly high, even as other green tech surges into mainstream use. But hydrogen has seen some steady, if quiet, progress. And over the past year, a heavy new round of investments from governments and institutions means the hydrogen economy is, once again, about to get interesting. Because it's time the world's lightest element start pulling its weight. So it, the hydrogen molecule is a very elegant molecule in terms of not having carbon to start with. It's a molecule that have high energy density. So when you uh, uh, split it or burn it uh, or convert it uh, electrochemically to extract energy, you're not generating carbon emissions. You're not generating emissions that are harmful or have negative impact on, uh, on the environment or the climate. Inas Abu Hamid is the CEO of H2Go, a company spun out of her work at Cambridge University. Her company builds hydrogen-based solutions for storing and generating energy, like a solid-state method for storing hydrogen that reduces safety risks, not to mention hydrogen-powered drones. Hydrogen is a happy gas. It doesn't want to be confined into um, one space, which means you have to compress it up to high level of pressures. And the problem with compression is that hydrogen is, is a flammable gas. When you're, when you're storing it at uh, high pressures, there are safety concerns and there are cost concerns. One of the repeated roadblocks that keeps getting in hydrogen's way is the issue of safety. The blast occurred in the hydrogen storage area of this plant here. We're now learning a balloon exploded on a test flight. At Golden Springs West the Brand Canyon, not the gas station. A hydrogen tanker truck was being fueled and it started leaking. The same happens with batteries as well. I mean, if you if you take any battery that you have anywhere around you and knock on it with a hammer, don't do that. <laughs> it will explode. <laughs> So with, uh, with hydrogen, mistakes could happen uh, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, not uh, unsafe engineering or unsafe implementations uh, uh, could be put in place uh, for many reasons. And uh, that, will, that could lead to uh, uh, explosions and failures, but so is with other materials or other gases. What is tricky is that hydrogen burns with an invisible flame and has no smell or taste. And is the tech that you're developing making this a much more safe element to be working with? Yes, because we replace or eliminate the pressure element from the storage process by converting chemically the hydrogen molecule as a gas into solid state or liquid state. Keep it there for long durations as long as the demand uh, is there and when the demand peaks basically we release it back into a, a gaseous form so it could be used either electrochemically by conversion using fuel cell or through a combustion a, a process and then it gets introduced to the end user as electricity whereas the only byproduct in the entire process is water vapor but also uh, if you solve the safety problem you still have other problems to solve Outside energy, hydrogen is used in plenty of other industries, most commonly in refining oil and making fertilizers. The problem is that currently, the way most of our hydrogen is made isn't clean at all. In fact, there's a whole color-coded system for different kinds of hydrogen, depending how they're made and their impact on the environment. There's blue hydrogen, it's made from methane, but some of the carbon emissions are captured during the process. Though blue hydrogen is included in many clean energy plans, Recent studies have cast doubt on the method's eco-friendliness. Gray hydrogen is the most common. It's also made from methane, but without even trying to suck up some of the mess. But electrolysis driven by renewable sources, like solar, wind, or geothermal power, creates what's called green hydrogen. This is the good eco-friendly hydrogen that we all like. Energy is being generated by 
solar panels or wind turbines and then the excess power from renewables can be then used to split water into hydrogen and oxygen through a process that is called electrolysis. And there's a lot of work that has been done to bringing the cost of electrolysis down to a point where it's becoming competitive. It's work in progress. It will take some time. With renewables like solar or wind, better storage would help cover us when there's no breeze or the sun isn't shining. So at times of high power generation, we could use any excess to electrolyze hydrogen, which would sit in a tank and be converted back into electricity at a later time. H2Go also developed software for managing these kinds of hydrogen systems. We have uh, actually completed trials, uh, 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 commercial trials, with partners in Orkney Islands in Scotland a few months ago, whereby basically we looked at uh, renewable energy generated from wind, uh, demand uh, on grid, and basically how the software could predict the generation, predict the demand, and bridge the gap uh, uh, perfectly. And what are some of the roadblocks that are getting in your way? What are your challenges? It was a real challenge to convince people that hydrogen has, has got a, a really interesting role to play. When we started the company, I was leading it, but I was younger than now. And it was very difficult to, to take me seriously because of my age. Talking about promises and, and potential when you have not had the white hair of experience to show, it's just, it's, it's hard, it's a challenge. It's been a hard struggle for many years, but in 2006, I built the, the uh, Western Hemisphere's first solar hydrogen fuel cell powered home that I live in to this day. So this has been 19 years off grid. Mike Strisky is so devoted to hydrogen the New York Times called his work the gospel of hydrogen power. He describes himself as a semi-retired engineer, and he's been preaching the good word about renewable energy for decades. But the conversions he does aren't the religious sort. Mike switches homes, vehicles, and businesses over to solar and clean hydrogen power. His New Jersey hydrogen house is a monument to all things hydrogen. Okay, so we have two hydrogen lawnmowers here. This is the one I cut my grass with. I have to ask you, how does your family feel about hydrogen? Are they tired of hearing you talk about it or are they all on board? Depends on the day. <laughs> my kids fought me about it in the early days. And then now they've taken over my businesses. I have 14 patents uh, in hydrogen generation in electrical connections and solar mounting systems. And uh, currently I'm working with student interns and companies to develop uh, renewable hydrogen energy systems to help combat uh, global warming and climate change. We can make hydrogen from anything. It's 80% of every molecule in the universe. I can make it from you. I can make it from water. I can make it from food waste, grass clippings. It's been used by NASA in every manned mis mission since Apollo in the most hazardous environment known to man, outer space. So we know how to use it for over 120 years. We've been using it. It's used commercially in everything. Um, to use it as the ultimate battery, that's fairly new. Spaceship Earth has just started adopting fuel cells for the last 10 years. In a fuel cell, hydrogen reacts with oxygen, creating an electrical current and outputting water vapor. The earliest hydrogen fuel cell designs go back to the 1800s. So we see them in forklifts from Amazon, Home Depot, uh, Walmart. All of these companies now are putting it into forklifts because they replace three forklifts with one. They can fill up in five minutes. They're starting producing trucks and trains, things you can't do with batteries. Airplanes cannot be flown with batteries because they weigh too much. We're talking about implementation of systems like that in aviation. Uh, from we're, we're focused at the moment on commercial drone size and one day maybe uh, the uh, uh, commercial aircraft, if you could run them on hydrogen uh, and use a very safe system, uh, that's a big advantage towards. We're also seeing a lot of interest uh, uh, on um, boats. The first ever hydrogen fuel cell car was built more than 50 years ago. At the time, the GMC Electrovan was a step into the future, though it topped out at 70 miles per hour. And back then, the tech was simply way too expensive to be commercially viable. These days, there are few hydrogen fuel cell cars on the market, and other models can be converted. Mike has a Mirai, Toyota's current hydrogen car. So this is the Mirai. I guess you're familiar with the car? Mm -hmm. I'm actually sitting on the fuel cell. So it's directly under the driver's seat. 
So this car I drove from Malibu to Vegas and back. And uh, I went through Death Valley and drank the water out of the fuel site. I, th I saw back there the um, motor vehicle home that you guys are converting. I've got two hydrogen fuel cells coming from um, California that we're going to put in this along with an electric drivetrain. It's got all the comforts of home. Yeah, it's really oh, nice. This will be totally autonomous when I'm done with it. So you're looking at this thing will be capable of making its own drinking water and processing its own sewage and generating all of its own electricity. Because hydrogen fuel cells are 60% efficient, you're looking at going five times as far on the same amount of BTU energy as a internal combustion engine. And if you were to diversify and you say lithium ion batteries in the city or for short distances and then hydrogen for to, to power uh, cars and he heavy transportation for longer durations, the diversification has an important impact on decarbonization, but also in, say, controlling the, the impact on uh, mining and having to rely on one source of metals, for example, that, that compose uh, uh, batteries. As early as 2021, there were only 45 hydrogen refueling stations in the whole United States, almost all of them in California. You know, you build the stations, they, the cars and the trucks will come. If the government is going to do something that makes some sense, they need to put in the hydrogen infrastructure. The cars and trucks are here. That's a no-brainer. The infrastructure is what we need. This summer, the U.S. Department of Energy announced a program to accelerate clean hydrogen innovations and spur demand for hydrogen tech. The stated goal is to reduce the cost of clean hydrogen by 80% in the next decade. A new plan from the U.K. government will invest up to four billion pounds in hydrogen over the next 10 years. You know, the Koreans, the Japanese, the Germans, the French are all doing this stuff and we're being left behind because we, we are an oil, coal and gas, you know, exporter. And so we're at a turning point. There's a narrative that clean hydrogen power has so much potential, but never really manages to break into the mainstream. Do you think that that's accurate? Yeah. Do I think we'll break into the mainstream? I think we hit, we're out of options. We're out of options. It's half past 12. Mother Nature is telling us loud and clear, you know, if you don't mend your ways, I will mend it for you. Well, I've always done the right thing, not the politically correct thing my entire career. And I'll never look back a moment and regret the decisions I've made. Now I'm trying to, you know, I've got eight grandchildren. I want to leave a planet for it. So, you know, I'm trying to give this next generation the keys, you know, to fix what we broke.